for inviting us to. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for joining us and for allowing us to present to you. Um, sorry we can't be there in person, but we all know how that goes these days. Why am I? It's not advancing. Thought I was on a roll here. Try that again. Maya, do you want to share? And I tried it earlier and it was working, but now it's not. I think you're muted. Try it again, Barry, and see if it works this time. We see it. Maybe I can go. There we go. All right, found a way to do it. So um, thanks again. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we will do questions at the end, I think, is the plan. After uh, I'll speak first, then Moya, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, so um, we're going to share the global medical care guidelines. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how they were created. Um, we'll present the, uh, we'll each present some of the guidelines, tell you what it is that we recommended, and in some cases why. And then we'll tell you some. Uh, things about how to get versions of the guidelines, if you would like, and then what's coming up next on our work with developing these guidelines. Uh, so this is me. I'm an um, associate professor at the University of Colorado. Um, I have going on 30 years of experience working with uh, adults with intellectual disabilities, quite a few with Down syndrome. I'm a, met I'm a member of the medical, uh, the Down syndrome medical interest group, I'm one of the co-authors of the guidelines with Moya and others, um, and my in research interests are about how um, we should be approaching preventative services for adults with Down syndrome, and that's part of what the guidelines help us with. Uh, this is our clinic. Um, the, the staff are me, um, another physician who works part-time in the clinic, uh, a social worker who we see all patients together. She also sees some patients on her own if they need behavioral health services. And then we have a, a currently physical therapist who come in and see all of the patients um, um, in tandem with us. And we're hoping to have nutrition soon. We currently don't. So global, uh, global Down Syndrome Foundation started as most down syndrome organizations do from a family. So a family in Colorado had a child with Down syndrome. When they looked around for um, answers about what her life would be like, what her health care would be like, um, medical issues that she might face, they found that there were a lot of gaps in what was known and what was needed to be known. Um, and so they had business connections and resources to gather others together to form the Global Down Syndrome Foundation. And when you look at the figure here, when you go down to the left, the Cernic Institute for Down Syndrome um, was established by Global to do basic research and also clinical research in um, the health and healthcare of people with Down Syndrome. I believe it's the largest single campus of researchers uh, in the US, possibly in the world, focusing on Down syndrome. Um, and they've had some breakthroughs already in the research that they've been able to uh, publish. To the right, you see the C Center for Down syndrome, and that's a Down syndrome clinic for children at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. Um, and they are able to see people from um, outside of Colorado, other countries, um, and I've seen um, a lot of patients with Down syndrome. And of course, they, when patients age out of the pediatric clinic, they uh, usually come to us. 
Um, bottom right is the adult Down syndrome clinic that I'm a part of. And bottom left is uh, that Global has also funded an Alzheimer's uh, Cognition Center evaluating Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome, which we know is more prominent than in people without Down syndrome. Uh, Global has worked very hard with the Congress and others and other advocacy groups to increase funding for Down syndrome research and has been very successful in doing that. Um, so as we looked at how do we advise families individuals and providers about healthcare for people with Down syndrome. Um, we were able to get some funding to work with an organization called ECRI. You can see their uh, name down at the bottom of that document. Um, they are very experienced in developing medical care guidelines. And so um, we worked with them over a period of about two years. And that was at least one conference call a month for two years with people in three different time zones, and not only that, but clinicians who are always hard to wrangle into, uh, into meetings. But we did it and we went through a very rigorous process to develop these um, guidelines. You can see there the nine topics that this set of guidelines covered. It's not comprehensive, but it was what we thought we could bite off on the first go around things that we thought were important that we might be able to find literature on to make informed decisions. Um, and we'll be doing more topics as time goes on. Um, when we finished the guidelines, we were able to get it published in a, um, a prestigious and widely read journal called the Journal of American Medical Association or JAMA. Um, and uh, that has been a, big benefit in getting the guidelines spread um, throughout the U.S. and throughout the world. Um, our guidelines are mainly targeted towards the U.S. population, but I think they're um, applicable to many people with Down syndrome. And as you'll see, they've been translated into several other languages. Um, the very rigorous way of doing these guidelines, um, you can see on the top, on the left, it says PICO questions, a very formal way of deciding exactly what do we think, what, what do we want to know, and how do we frame the question in a way that we might be able to find uh, literature on, publish research on the topics. Um, we spent several months going through each of these questions to figure out exactly what do we want to learn. Then a, um, a literature review was done to find articles. I think at first, there were maybe 6,000 articles that eventually got whittled down to about, uh, I think, 25 or so articles that had information that we thought met our criteria and that would give us good information to uh, use to form these guidelines. And then again, there was a very um, deliberative process on changing that what we found out from the literature review into guidelines that we could um, distribute to people. Um, one of the other unique things about these guidelines is not only did we have Down syndrome clinical experts working on the uh, process, but we also, once we have the guidelines, we got focus groups together with uh, individuals with Down syndrome, with uh, family members or caregivers, and presented the guidelines to them and said, what do you think of these? Do they seem helpful? Do these, does it seem like your interest and concerns were taken into account on these guidelines. And uh, as you can see, 82% thought we had done a good job on it. So that was very satisfying. All right. So now into the guidelines themselves. The first one is regarding osteoporosis. Um, you may or may not know that osteoporosis is thinning of the bones where the bones are weaker and the reason we are concerned about weak bones, of course, is they can lead to fractures. Um, if someone has a fracture that shouldn't have happened in a person with healthy bones, we call that a fragility fracture. So the bones are fragile when the person has had a fragility fracture. Um, we have seen studies that show that um, when you look at tests for thinning bones in people with Down syndrome, uh, using a device called a DEXA scan, it's an x-ray test, 
that measures bone density, that there's using that test a high risk of osteoporosis in adults with Down syndrome. Still, we were not sure whether those results of a decrease in bone density seen by this test translate into there being more fragility factors in people with Down syndrome. Um, we also weren't really sure how accurate the, these DEXA scans were in, um, in showing bone density in people with Down syndrome. People with Down syndrome have, of course, often shorter legs, shorter stature, and um, we think the bones are actually sort of constructed differently and, and are metabolized differently than people without Down syndrome. And so one of the ultimate things we really wanted to know is, can we prevent fractures in people with osteoporosis by using particular medicines which are used the most for osteoporosis called bisphosphonates? So those are the questions we hope to be able to answer. In the end, unfortunately, we really couldn't answer those questions directly, but um, the guidelines for clinicians point out that we, that we encourage clinicians to exercise caution in using the same kind of measurements, these DEXA scan measurements in people with Down syndrome, because we're really not sure that they show bone density the same way that they do in people without Down syndrome, and we're not sure whether they are predictive of having a fracture. In the end, what we were able to recommend is that if people with Down syndrome do have a what we call a fragility fracture, a fracture that should not have happened in a person with healthy bones, that an evaluation should be done to look for other causes of osteoporosis other than just getting older, things such as hyperthyroidism or overactive thyroid gland, celiac disease, which is gluten uh, insensitivity, vitamin D deficiency, hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid gland is a gland that controls the uh, calcium in the bloodstream. And if it's overactive, it elevates the calcium in the bloodstream by pulling calcium out of bones, which can lead to osteoporosis. And there are some medicines associated with uh, adverse effects on bone health. And so we encourage clinicians to look at those. So next is what's called atlantoaxial instability. Um, if some of you are newer to the issue of medical care of people with Down syndrome um, or have younger uh, family members, this, you might not have heard as much about this. It used to be that it was considered a very significant issue in people with Down syndrome. And when people with Down syndrome were gonna participate in Special Olympics, Special Olympics required that an X-ray be done to look for this um, atlantoaxial instability. If you look at the pictures, um, the one on the left labeled figure one, you can see what's labeled the spinal cord. That's where the nerve conduction is carried from the brain down to the rest of the body. And the spinal cord goes between bones in, the, in your uh, spine. And each of the bones is called a vertebra. So when you look again at figure one, you can see that the first vertebra is called the atlas. The second is called the axis. Um, the atlas, of course, supports the whole skull. The axis, the second vertebra, uh, helps the with turning the head and stabilizing the head in the transition between the, the skull and the spinal cord. When you look at the figure two on the right, you can see again the atlas and the axis. You can see a depiction of kind of a cone-shaped structure that goes from the axis up into the atlas, and that's what provides stability. That little cone-shaped process is called a dens, and the uh, dens helps to hold these two vertebrae together. There's a ligament that goes around the dens to hold it in place, and so that prevents the bones from moving abnormally, which can damage the spinal cord. You can see in the middle uh, drawing of figure two in a person without atlantoaxial instability when the head moves forward, the two vertebra move together and um, nothing changes in their relationship to each other. The one on the right shows atlantoaxial instability, which is the top bone, the atlas, sliding forward compared to the one under it. And if you remember, the spinal cord goes inside these bones and if one uh, 
bone slides forward relative to the others, that could pinch the spinal cord and cause damage to the spinal cord, which is can be catastrophic. Um, studies have shown over many years that this is very common in people with Down syndrome, or about 10% of people with Down syndrome, if you do the x-rays, will have atlantoaxial instability. So for many years, it was thought that this would be a risk for spinal cord injuries, and people who have this abnormality on an x-ray shouldn't participate in some sports where their head might get flexed or bent forward forcefully. Um, but as time went on and more studies were done, it was found that spinal cord injuries in people with Down syndrome are very rare. They're fairly rare in the general population, but they are rare in people with Down syndrome. And when people did have a spinal cord injury, whether they had atlantal axial instability or not didn't seem to make any difference. So in other words, if you do an X-ray and you find that there is atlantal axial instability, that doesn't really tell you how much the person is at risk of having a spinal cord injury. Because many people with spinal cord injuries don't have instability, and most people with instability never have a spinal cord injury. So that led to our recommendation um, that the cervical spine x-rays really are not helpful. Um, if you do an x-ray and it shows that there's instability, and you say, well, this person can't participate in certain sports, it's very unlikely that they're gonna get a spinal cord injury and you're depriving them of having the social and personal um, benefit of participating in that sport. Um, and the same thing, if you do the x-ray and they don't show atlantal axial instability, that doesn't tell you that they are protected and won't have any problems. So really the x-rays just don't help one way or the other. And so the recommendation is to review, is for the clinician to review signs and symptoms of the spinal cord being damaged by this instability, looking for um, abnormal reflexes or weakness or numbness in the arms or the legs, um, difficulty using the hands, uh, more stumbling or falling. Those can be signs of a spinal cord injury. And we encourage clinicians to use that as a screening for atlantal axial instability rather than relying on the x-rays. And Special Olympics is now doing that as well. All right, next we'll move on to thyroid. Um, the thyroid is a gland in the neck that secretes thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone helps the body to use energy. Um, if the thyroid is overactive, which is not very common, um, but if it's overactive, that leads to weight loss, everything being sort of speeded up. Weight loss, heart rate is fast. Some people get diarrhea. On the other hand, if the thyroid gland is underactive, which is much, much more common, um, then the person has less energy. They might have more constipation, um, be more sluggish, uh, feel fatigue during the day. Um, so the thyroid gland is very important in how we feel and how we're able to, uh, how our health is. Um, it's underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism is really very common in people with Down syndrome. Um, as many as close to 50% of people with Down syndrome will have an underactive thyroid gland. In people without Down syndrome, we often rely on them reporting symptoms of fatigue, constipation, um, lack of energy. Um, that the, we People will report those things to us and then we'll check to see if they have an underactive thyroid gland. Um, people with Down syndrome, of course, often have those symptoms, whether they have underactive thyroid gland or not. And quite a few people are not um, able to communicate uh, symptoms that way. So it can be hard to rely on symptoms to decide whether a person with Down syndrome has an underactive thyroid gland or not. So we felt that, um, oops. So our recommendation is that adults with Down syndrome should be screened with a test called a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone test, very common test um, that can be done in primary care office. 
Now that test should be done every one to two years, uh, uh, beginning at age 21. And I think the, the guidelines are similar for people under 21 years of age um, to look for hypothyroidism and consider treatment with thyroid hormone if the person does have an underactive thyroid. All right, now moving on to the next one. I'm in a little trouble here. So cardiovascular disease. So probably all of you know that people with Down syndrome have a high incidence of structural heart disease. That means that there's something wrong with the way the heart is formed. Very often um, holes between chambers of the heart that shouldn't be there. Sometimes valve problems. The valves are, when the heart pumps, it pumps blood out and the valves keep the blood from flowing back. Um, and a lot of people with Down syndrome have trouble with their valves. So a lot of structural heart disease, but those of us who take care of a lot of patients with Down syndrome have felt that um, what we call atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so the clogging of the arteries to the heart, uh, to that go to the heart muscle and that cause um, heart attacks, um, it, that seemed to be very uncommon in people with Down syndrome. There's a lot of interest in why that is and some research going on to assess that. Um, we weren't able to find good research to back that up, but that's been all of our experience. Um, and in the end, we decided basically that we should treat people with Down syndrome the same as people without Down syndrome. There's a, a risk calculator that all clinicians have and use daily you plug in um, what the person's age, sex, uh, ethnicity, whether they have high blood pressure, their cholesterol levels, and whether they have diabetes, and that calculates out um, what their risk of is having a heart attack for the general population. Again, this is not specific for people with Down syndrome. We don't have one yet. Um, and the recommendation is to use that risk calculator to decide whether a person should be treated for high cholesterol in order to try to prevent heart attacks. Um, most of the time when we do this calculation, it will um, come out saying that it doesn't make clinical sense to treat a person with Down syndrome with one of these cholesterol lowering medicines, but our, we didn't find any good evidence to treat people with Down syndrome differently than people without Down syndrome. So the recommendation was just to do things the same as we do in people without Down syndrome to screen every five years starting at age 40. Um, another uh, concern is stroke. Stroke means that a part of the brain has not gotten a blood supply and has died. And there are different things that can cause strokes. Um, it can be that there's a blockage of the arteries that go to the brain, usually in the neck, and that prevents blood from going to the brain and part of the brain dies because it doesn't have enough uh, blood flow. Another thing that can cause a stroke is a blood clot coming from the heart, traveling through the arteries and getting stuck in a smaller artery inside the brain and that cuts off blood flow to that part of the brain. Um, and the third major way is if a blood vessel bursts inside the brain, that puts pressure on other parts of the brain, um, and that can lead to death of brain tissue. So again, we don't think that the clogs in the arteries of people with Down syndrome is a major cause of um, stroke because we think people don't get that kind of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, we do think there's a high chance of problems coming from the heart, often related to the congenital heart disease, the structural defects of the heart that we talked about. Um, so if a blood clot is in the heart, it can get pumped up into the arteries, go to the brain and cause a stroke. And it's treatment of heart disease is part of the reason why um, people with Down syndrome live so much longer now than they used to because before we had ways of correcting these heart defects, um, people would um, either die from the heart disease directly or they would have a blood clot from the heart, travel up to the brain and cause a stroke. So our recommendation to clinicians is that um, people should be evaluated for the risk of strokes. 
Some of the same things that apply to people without Down syndrome, for example, don't smoke cigarettes, uh, treat the diabetes well, that sort of thing we think should be done for people with Down syndrome, but to pay especially uh, careful attention to any structural defects in the heart that could lead to strokes. And I will turn it over now to uh, Dr. Peterson. Hey, Barry, leave your screen share up because I think um, I'm using your link. Okay. Let me see if this works. Okay. Uh, Barry, th this is not going to be a good view. Could you just go ahead and share your screen and then, or uh, show the do the slides, and I'll just tell you when to click. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. My name's Moya Peterson. Oh, here. Sorry. My name's Moya Peterson, and I am a nurse practitioner. I have a um, PhD in nursing, and I'm a family nurse practitioner in the Department of Family Medicine at KU. Um, which is University of Kansas. We're located in Kansas City, Kansas. And I've uh, worked there for a long time. And then in 2009, um, decided that uh, we wanted to specialize um, in a for a clinic with adults with Down syndrome. We have a very excellent clinic um, right across the state line. Our campus backs right up to the state line between Kansas and Missouri. And in Missouri, we have an excellent uh, children's uh, Down syndrome clinic. And so we, I saw no need to reinvent the wheel. And so I started this adult clinic because the, we just uh, didn't have any of these kind of resources in the Midwest. Uh, Dr. Martin's clinic was as close as, as we could get. Um, and so we decided to start this clinic. And um, I'm a nurse practitioner, and it's kind of a unique clinic in that um, there aren't very many that are, are run by a nurse practitioner. Um, and then I have uh, I have a doc that is my medical consultant, and we have a um, dietitian that sees all of our patients as well. Okay. So um, probably um, this is probably one of the more difficult, um, I think, guidelines. It was hard to um, to hone down what we wanted to, wanted to say about the behaviors because they're so diverse. And um, it, it really is a difficult area. Um, we recommend a review of um, behavioral, functional, adaptive, and, and psychosocial factors um, from all the adults. Um, it, sometimes it's something very simple, like a staff member has changed at the group home, and that will send behaviors um, out and, and you know, we're not sure why, but you know, the, the routine that's very important to our guys uh, gets out of whack. Um, you know, a, a brother or sister, maybe they go away to college and that causes problems. So there's just lots of issues um, that happen and we have to annually make sure that things are steady, especially if there's been a behavioral change. Um, we, uh, you have to rule out first, sometimes behaviors are um, a, a flag that something else is going on. Um, and my our friend Dennis McGuire that worked with Barry for a long time um, talks about every behavior is trying to tell us something and we just have to figure out what it is. So the first thing we really have to do is rule out some things in the in the history. And some of those things that Barry's already talked about is thyroid. Um, we have to make sure that's functioning well. We're concerned about their hearing and their vision. Um, you know, if you can't hear what's going on, then you can, uh, a person feels very isolated, can have behaviors, or if they can't see. Uh, sometimes sleep uh, will very much impact. And we know that our guys um, are very at risk for obstructive sleep apnea. And when you're tired and you're not sleeping, you do all sorts of things to stay awake. Uh, and your, um, your attention span is shorter you're dealing with people around you, you just can't because you're just tired. And so we talk about sleep a lot. It could be pain as well. Um, I have, I had one young man that um, 
was a headbanger and he, he would whack his head into the wall whenever something hurt. And so we had to look for where the pain was because he couldn't tell us. And um, it, it wasn't the best coping mechanism to deal with the pain, but that's the way we figured out that, that he would tell us that he, something was hurting. Also, you wanna make sure that you talk about family history, um, if there's any other kind of mental health issues that may be prevalent in the family. So we um, we get take care of all of that. And um, the challenges are that this population is very unique. Um, we know that self-talk is very common in this population and is part of who they are, um, as, as can be imaginary friends. Um, and this is not a, a behavior that we need to be concerned about unless it really um, causes problems. Um, so it's not a sign of schizophrenia. Uh, it's just who they are, and we just accept that. And so that's a unique part of this population. They also have an extraordinary visual memory and they can remember things. Um, if they've seen it, then they can, they remember it. Uh, I have a friend that has Down syndrome and she can take me all over the town that she lives in um, and has never driven, has never gone anywhere independently, but she remembers where to turn and what to do. So they have an extraordinary visual memory and we try to work with that in, in helping them deal. Uh, they also have some limits to understanding time. Uh, they're very present in the moment. So if maybe the pain is not hurting them right now, then they don't understand what the concern is. Um, and so uh, it's these unique characteristics make it uh, pretty difficult. It also, um, they they can present some behaviors and and they have they can't tell you where it hurts and they can't tell you what it feels like. Um, if they're verbal and if they're nonverbal, it's even more difficult. So um, just know that if if there's a behavior, you need to talk to your um, primary care about looking for all the medical conditions, looking what's changed in their lives, um, doing some blood work, thinking about what's going on. Is something changed at their work situation? And all of those issues um, have to be figured in. Um, and then to treatment, then we follow kind of the... Um, guidelines in the in the two manuals that's mentioned here okay this is a big issue dementia is a, a huge issue um in uh in the down syndrome world uh, i read a study one time that says there's only a couple things that that medical students remember when they graduate from medical school about down syndrome one is it's trisomy 21 and the other is they all get they all get dementia and so um that's not true. Um, so it's really overdiagnosed and we have to um, we have to think about that. So our first recommendation was that for adults with Down syndrome younger than 40, it's doubtful um, that they're dealing with Alzheimer's type dementia. It just doesn't occur in, in age 40. The other thing that we recommended is that to do some type of baseline screening every year at the age of 40. And there's um, the National Task Group Early Detection Screen for Dementia um, is, a, is a good one. It's a long one and it's a good one, but it looks at all these different areas, cognition, behavior, communication, ambulation, uh, general decline. And so it's, it's hard to remember sometimes when these occur so slowly and um, it isn't until it gets bad, maybe you think, boy, you know, a year ago he could do that or a couple years ago, you know, they, they knew what was going on. And so you, you want to do this baseline functioning, baseline screening every year. And this is a, a it's a paper and pencil kind of uh, thing. And, and so you do that and then compare them. So the things to remember is that more, that it, dementia is more common uh, in people with Down syndrome, but not before the age of 40. Um, so if you're, kiddo is 35 or 30 and, you know, things are changing, you need to look for some other reason. In reality, the incidence only about half of those between 50 and 59 uh, really have Alzheimer's, but certainly once they get past the age of 60, um, the incidence goes up a great deal and we have to um, we have to think about it. But the, the key to this is that if it's, if it's younger than age 40, we need to look for another reason, okay? 
Um, diabetes is um, pretty pretty common among our guys, uh, type one and type two. Um, the recommendation was that if uh, if your uh, adult is asymptomatic, that we can do a screening. And that screening is a hemoglobin A1C. And what that is, is um, a simple blood test. And even it's a, a finger prick in the office of, of most offices will have uh, uh, the, the finger prick device in their office. And it looks at how the, the glucose molecules attach to the red blood cells. And so it gives us a pretty good accurate, or it gives us a pretty good estimate of how high their blood sugar has been over the last three months. And so, um, and usually in routine blood work, we'll, we'll pick up a, a glucose value, um, but that's really dependent on whether they've eaten or, you know, what they had the night before. So there's all sorts of things that can change that. And the A1C is much more reliable, but it should be performed at least every three years, beginning at age 30. And so that was our recommendation. The ADA, if you look down at the bottom there, says that they start screening at age 45. And we think that for our adults with Down syndrome. Whoops, go back. Thank you. Um, we think with our guys with Down syndrome, they ought to be starting at age 30. Um, certainly if, um, if the adult with Down syndrome is overweight, um, that we need to be screening more often and starting earlier. So we recommend that it should start at age 21. And again, the ADA recommends that be started earlier um, but again, we're starting at a, at a younger age for our guys to make sure that um, we get this diabetes diagnosed early. Okay. Um, diabetes is a, is a common concern. Um, it Type 2 certainly is hereditary. Um, it also um, uh, has can be can happen when people are overweight, which our guys are um, at, a, at a high prevalence for. And so there's just all sorts of issues here that we need to monitor this pretty closely. Um, the potential benefits way out risk, a way out um, way, way, <laughs> way outweigh um, the potential uh, risks. So the benefits are that we we think that it reduces the development of neuropathy, which is nerve damage, retinopathy, which is eye damage, and kidney disease that, that we commonly associate with type 2 diabetes. And if we can get the handle on the diabetes early and get those blood sugar managed, then, then we, can, um, we can prevent those happening. The, um, the, the diabetes can be controlled, type 2 diabetes can be controlled with medication, and we can make sure it's oral medication, and so we can make sure that um, those those things are taken care of. Um, the potential harms of being overly aggressive or hypoglycemia, but we can manage that um, with medications. Some of the medications do not cause low blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia, so it doesn't cause the low blood sugar, so we want to make sure they have that, or they might have some medication side effects, but they're not very common. But it just that we can aggressively treat type 2 diabetes without any problems and maybe save some, some other more serious damage later down the road. Okay. Obesity. This is a tough one. Um, we, we think that the me metabolic rate is a little bit different in adults with Down syndrome, but nonetheless, uh, the same things that apply to you and I um, to manage our our weight applies to them. A healthy diet, regular exercise, and calorie management. Um, there's benefits to exercise, um, but we can't count on it alone. The Some of the studies that we're seeing show that when they have regular exercise, we watch their calories. Um, they're in a study. Uh, my university carries on a lot of studies in um, adults with intellectual delay, uh, with weight loss and and they all lose weight. They they get in some of the studies they get a Fitbit and they all lost weight. They all exercised and as soon as the study was over, they quit exercising and ate what they want and gained the weight all back. So you can't just say you know oh they're active you know they're in Special Olympics or they're dancing or all of all of those kind of things because that doesn't always manage the weight. 
Um, it has to be certainly the um, the three legs of the stool um, that you're going to do. It's Otherwise, the stool doesn't work as well. So it has to be a healthy diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, regular exercise, and then watching the calorie manage um, calorie management. Uh, one of those without the other two just doesn't work. Okay. Not all people with Down syndrome are overweight, although um, it it takes a um, fairly aggressive uh, approach to it, and um, and it and I think the approach needs to start early, um, and so uh, it's it's a it's a lifestyle that they have to learn and they have to learn how to deal with, and um, so that's important. But they don't have to be overweight just because they have Down syndrome. Uh, we do think that this, the research suggests that a, that a lower metabolic rate may contribute to people with Down syndrome. So if an adult with Down syndrome eats the same thing that I do, it may be that they're going to gain weight and I don't. Uh, so that has to be taken into effect. There's still a lot of questions that we have. Is We talk a lot about BMI um, in, in everybody and that... Um, we wonder if the BMI targets are correct for our guys or whether they might be different. We think they're probably are different. And there's a lot of treatments being bandied about now for weight loss. Um, and we just wonder if they're safe and effective. And we're just now starting to use some of those drugs for our guys that are really um, have weight issues and whether or not that's gonna be safe and effective for them, we just don't know yet, okay? Okay, the other thing I might mention um, is that we also know that antipsychotic drugs and uh, some childhood cancers make our guys more at risk. And we we do know that our guys have all had those issues. So um, for diabetes and for obesity. So um, we have to take that into consideration. That makes our guys kind of unique. Okay, thanks, Barry. Uh, Celiac, um, the um, is the gluten issues. I think probably everybody's familiar with that. We need to do an annual assessment of how they're doing. Uh, some of the symptoms um, are are direct, and some of the symptoms uh, can be due to um, uh, insufficient absorption of of different vitamin and minerals. Um, but this is a, a fairly common disorder in our guys. Next. So be sure that you talk, I guess, um, I'll just, you can leave it here, Barry. Be sure that you talk to your doc um, about some of the symptoms of celiac. The, the, some of the symptoms are weight loss, diarrhea, um, abdominal discomfort, and certainly a change in behavior um, because they're, maybe have some cramping and so they don't feel good. We think that it has a 10 to 11% incidence in our guys. So 10% uh, of our guys are going to have celiac. So be sure you talk if you see a change in behaviors. Sorry, if you hear a change in, if you see a change in behaviors or you see a change in their bowel habits. So finally, um, some of the things that are coming out, the family friendly global guideline, it's shorter. Um, the medical terms are defined. We get you know, when you're writing these kind of things, you get very comfortable with some of the terms and think everybody understands them and they don't. And so it made it hard for parents and they said they needed some definitions. So we got those. Um, and so um, it's it's written so that the families can use it and so that the families can take it with them. The same uh, topic areas are covered. And then uh, we've we've also tried to do it so that the adults can, can understand them as well. Um, you can do whatever you want to do, but unless your adult decides that they're going to participate in this, it makes it very, very hard to get anything accomplished. And um, I had a, I had, I was, had one of my patients, uh, a young lady come and talk to the medical students. And in the middle of the, in the presentation, we were talking about thyroid disorder. And she looked at me and she said, and by the way, it's time for my TSH. And so um, it's good to have buy-in. So we hope that uh, we've made it so that they can they can read it as well. Next. 
Um, it was requested by the self-advocates of the families and uh, during those uh, focus groups that uh, Dr. Martin talked about. And uh, so we can also, you can also get copies of it. Um, you can download it yourself or you can uh, order it and um, take it to your primary care doc or to other family members or to um, uh, other groups that you might think would be helpful. So um, it, it gives us, it gives you some idea of where to go and how to take care of your adult. Okay. Here's kind of what it looks like. So we couldn't have done it without all the supporters. Um, you can see there that the your group was very active in this and we appreciate um, that support. Uh, it, it it took a lot. Um, we had a couple, uh, two or three day meeting where, where all the authors got together and um, it was uh, wonderful to be there, but it was costly to bring all those flights in and something that simple. Um, and and uh, costs a lot. And so we appreciate all the support that you gave to us um, to do this, to do all these functions for you, okay? So what's next? Um, we're very excited. We it um, When we got the first round published, we all took a big sigh of relief. And then the next week we start, or the next month we started on the on the next stage, okay? And the next stage is um, kind of making some checklists so that you could print off a one page thing and keep it. Um, a lot of my my folks have a notebook that they keep and you can keep that in your notebook or with the, his with your child's medical records and check off the things as they um, get accomplished. Um, also, we put together a diabetes toolkit. It gives a body mass index, the BMI down there at the bottom and what you should do and uh, what should be um, evaluated. And then also we felt like celiac was important enough that we needed, again, to um, give a checklist for that. <clears throat> and so if you're, you know, something has changed, their um, weight has changed or they they don't feel good or you can go down through that and see if he's having symptoms of celiac and that's helpful to take to your primary care as well, okay? Um, also, we're translating into a, a number of different languages. The Spanish and the Japanese versions have been completed. Um, there, it's in the um, Down Center Medical Interest Group, we have a really strong representation from Mexico. And so we've been able to make sure that they have access to the guidelines. And you can see that Italian is currently in progress as well as Albanian and Swahili. So um, we're very um, excited that these are gonna be um, available to people around the world. But as we um, exhaled from the last experience, we knew there were other things that we need to uh, attend to. And we've tried to once again, um, boil them down to things we thought there might be um, evidence for, and there might be articles that we could look at. Uh, sleep apnea is a big issue for our guys. Uh, solid tumor cancers, leukemias in adulthood, um, physical fitness that kind of um, pages in with the obesity and, and the um, those concerns. So we thought that we need to look at that. And then vision and eye health were also, as they have some unique um, eye problems as well. So those are the next topic areas that we're looking into, as well as um, going back through the, the first nine and make sure that we've got literature that's up to date and what else, what other research has come out on those guidelines and those topic areas since we wrote those. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, we appreciate all that you do. Um, I do believe that our adults with Down syndrome have the very best parents in the world. Um, they they love their kids and they they want to do the best for them and they want to see them succeed. And they're amazing in their resiliency. You're um, amazing in your innovation. And we uh, thank you all for what you do for us and what you do for your kids. Okay. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I think uh, one of the takeaways that I, I would like to just talk about is that 
you are updating and constantly adding. So for, I will send the link to the Global Down Syndrome Foundation ways to access these guidelines, but you continually add to that. So I would encourage everyone to continue to keep checking um, to see all the updates. Um, it's it's a wonderful thing that you guys are, it's, it's not a done deal. It's a work in progress. <laughs> um, and so we greatly appreciate everything that you are doing to put into that. Um, so we do have a couple questions. Um, one of them is about sleep apnea. Um, is there a recommendation for obstructive sleep apnea for those who are not tolerant and using a CPAP or a BiPAP? Um, yeah, Barry, you chime in if you have find anything different. There, there is. Um, there, they are starting to place the um, oh, Inspire, uh, which is the implantable device. Um, that does the work of the CPAP by raising it, 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 they implant it, and then they have wires that go a couple different places. And when it picks up that you're not breathing, um, it, it uh, innervates the soft palate to rise so that it clears the, the airway so that they'll breathe. Um, and it also innervates the diaphragm to take a breath. So um, we're finding some very good success with that. So you, um, at night, when the kids get ready to go to bed, they just hold this remote kind of up in here, and it op it turns on the the little mechanism, and it, and they don't have to wear a mask. And you it, you can see it advertised on TV, and we're finding now that it's working pretty well um, in our guys with um, with Down syndrome. Also, there's some good um, uh, programs that you can get for desensitization of masks and and the machines and things and it takes a while um but um you can you can work with them a lot of uh, of the ot people have good uh, desensitization programs that you can use i would just add uh same thing that uh psychologists or behavior specialists can sometimes develop a program of desensitization or reward program that will get people to um use the CPAP, obviously weight loss helps, but it's not going to result, you know, even if you achieve weight loss, it won't necessarily resolve the sleep apnea. Yeah. And, um, and sleep apnea is really hard on the body in so many ways that it's worth mm -hmm. trying any way you can to get it treated because it can really make a big difference in the person's life. Yeah. I, I, my, my goal and dream in life is to have people like Taylor Swift and some of those icons that our adults love so much to really demonstrate how cool CPAPs are so they can wear them. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I think, think somebody talked about using Top Gun, the movie Top Gun, um, as oh. for the mask too. Right. Say, Look, you're like, Tom, you're like Tom Cruise and Top exactly. Gun. Right. I love it. Yeah. So and then another question we have is our daughter with Down syndrome has severe overpronunciation in her ankles. How would joint laxity affect knee and hip issues in the long term? Anybody? I, I can start on that one if you like. Um, it is quite a common uh, issue for people with Down syndrome. They have um, laxity in the joints, as you said, so the ligaments aren't as strong and as uh, tight and so joints move in ways that they shouldn't be moving and that leads to arthritis. Um, we see a lot of people with knee problems and especially hip problems uh, in Down syndrome because of that laxity and also low muscle tone, which also uh, because of the, the low muscle tone, the joints aren't as protected as they could be. Um, so uh, if you know, working on getting the feet stabilized. So um, seeing a podiatrist or an orthotist who can create um, orthotics for the shoes so that the person's uh, flat feet don't affect their gait so much can be a big help. And then just keeping the person as active as possible and um, keeping their weight down as much as possible will help to protect the joints. Great. Thank you. And then one last question, it looks like. Um, my son has sick sinus syndrome. He is 50, being treated with high sodium diet. Any thoughts? I hope he's, um, my thought is, I hope he's seeing a cardiologist. <laughs> right. Because right. I don't, uh, that's way out of my scope. 
can't think of any folks with Down syndrome that I've had who have that particular problem. A lot of people with Down syndrome do have uh, very slow heart rates normally mm -hmm. and low blood pressures normally. Um, if their heart isn't generating enough uh, beats to keep up with things, uh, sometimes, you know, a high sodium diet can increase the volume in the blood system and that can help to perfuse the tissues. Of course, sometimes people would need a pacemaker to, if the heart is not beating fast enough and responding to demand enough, um, sometimes a pacemaker, but certainly um, ideally a cardiologist who's familiar with adults with congenital heart disease would be uh, who you'd want to have evaluate the your family member. Yep. Makes total sense. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, um, Moya and Barry, for spending the morning with us and giving us all this great information. Um, I will send out a recording of this webinar next week sometime, and then also the link to Global Down Syndrome Foundation so you can access the guidelines. All right. Well, thank weekend. you for the opportunity. Thanks again. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a Oops, hang on one second. Oh, just thank you all. Okay, <laughs> not a question. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you.